and was out fishing one day when he heard a noise next to him. It was a, looked down, it was a frog. And the frog looked up to him and said, hey, buddy, I've had a spell cast on me. If you kiss me, I'll turn into a, a beautiful princess and I'll make you the most happiest person in the, in the world for the rest of your life. And with that, the old preacher just picked up the frog and put it in his pocket. A little bit later, kind of checked on the frog and, and exasperated the frog and said, hey, buddy, I, I've had a spell on, cast on me. If you kiss me, I'll turn into a beautiful princess and will make you so happy for the rest of your life. Preacher didn't say anything, just smiled and kept on fishing. A little bit later, checked on the frog again. And the frog just kind of says, what's wrong with you, fella? I've, I've been bewitched. Uh, just kiss me and I'll turn into a beautiful princess and I'll make you the happiest man for the rest of your life. And with that, the old preacher looked at the frog and he says, frog, I, I hate to tell you this, but at my age, I would rather have a talking frog than a beautiful princess. <laughs> I'll tell you, this was the easiest and the hardest sermon to work on in this sermon series. The easiest because all of all the theories, all the theories matching the deadly sins with Gilligan's Island, they universally match Lost with the movie star. The hardest is because you have to be very careful when choosing illustrations that deal with Lost. <laughs> So let's have a recap here. We're on the tail end of learning about the seven deadly sins according to the character's behavior on the popular show Gilligan's Island. This week, I received a Bible study. I've been waiting for it. It was on back order. I finally got it. It is called Gilligan's Island and the Seven Deadly Sins. And it is based on a reunion show. It comes out about, uh, came out about eight or ten years after the original show. It's called Rescue from Gilligan's Island. And, and the show goes like this. Uh, Gilligan is, is out getting his firewood. But because he represents a sloth, um, he's busy picking up seashells. And, and, and so he finds this metal disc. And so he picks up the metal disc and he takes it to the professor. And the professor uses this metal disc to create a barometer. And he says to Gilligan, well, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is that a huge storm is coming up to this island, and we may all get rescued. The bad news is they also may drown at the same time. Now, one of the things that we're going to learn about next week is the professor represents pride. And so he says to Gilligan that, that um, he needs to perfect this. He needs to figure it out. So he tells Gilligan to, to remain mum. Don't say anything until he's figured this out. And so that's what Gilligan does. He, he just walks around the island, just goes, mum, 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 mum. He just doesn't say anything. And so next, so he's out on uh, another part of the island, and the, the skipper, who represents anger, comes up to him. And, and because Gilligan just says, mum, uh, the skipper just gets really angry with him. Until the skipper finds out that he's probably dealing, talking about something about being rescued. And so he runs off real quickly. And then up comes uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Owl, who represent greed and gluttony. And so again, Gilligan is, is just mom, and, and so Mr. Owl actually pulls out a wad of dollar bills, and he says, he says, I'll give you money, I'll give you money if you tell me the answer. But they finally figure out that he's probably talking about being rescued, and, and Mrs. Howell actually walks away, and the thing she says is, I wonder what someone wears to a rescue. <laughs> and then walks in the sin of the day. Ginger, the movie star. In a very sultry, seductive way, she comes up to Gilligan and she kisses him on the cheek. She knows he's got a secret, and so he just says, mum, 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 mum. But he doesn't give it away. So, there we've got this symbol. We lock up there. Yep, Not moving ahead. We got one place. Okay. It, it, why don't you go ahead and just try closing out a PowerPoint and see if it comes back on, see if that works. All right. So as we're working on that. Well, one of the things that we find out is the entire episode of this rescue from Gilligan's Island all has to deal with the seven deadly sins. 
Well, today's lesson is on lust. So let's go ahead and take a look at, uh, at the definition. Uh, one of the things we're dealing with here is, is throughout this sermon series, the seven deadly sins is anything that keeps us, that keeps us from focusing on God. In fact, does it move us any closer to God? In fact, it kind of moves us farther away, more distant. Does not make us a better person. When you think about it, it is deadly to our faith life. It is deadly because our minds are set on earthly things and not on God. In fact, we even see this in our definition from Scripture. So let's go ahead and give this a try. See if we can advance here. There we go. We're getting closer. Yes, yes. It's working. All right. So now would you go ahead and read us the Scripture from Matthew. You've heard it, that it is said, do not commit adultery. But now I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman and wants to possess her is guilty of committing adultery with her in his heart. So if your right eye causes you to sin, take it out and throw it away. It is much better for you to lose a part of your body than to have your whole body thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is much better for you to lose one of your limbs than to have your whole body off to hell. Thank you, Max. To me, this seemed to be the most unusual passage. I mean, how could one actually commit adultery if they were just kind of lusting in their heart or their head? Well, let me share with you one of the uh, a sermon or sermon illustrations that I found that was a little bit cleaner that I could share about lust. Um, back in 06, uh, a Russian by the name of Vladimir Vilosov decided to build his own cap coffin to accommodate his vast collection of pornography. He said in an interview, the girls in those magazines have been my companions for years, said Vilosov, 66, and I want, to, I want them to accompany me into the next life. Now, I've worked with a lot of morticians over the years, and that request doesn't seem that unusual. But it doesn't answer the question, why does Jesus say this? Does that mean that we just can't go to the grave with our dirty magazines? No, it's a concept that is called building a fence around Torah. Now, building a fence, that's something that's understandable. When we moved here uh, about five years ago, we had two dogs, and eventually we gained two cats. And, but we also have neighbors, and we learned that our neighbors don't like our dogs and cats to be in their lawn. And so we decided uh, to tether our dogs and keep our cats indoors until our privacy fence was built. Now, a fence is great. It's not only for great for keeping your dogs and cats in, but it also keeps out the corn stalks out of our backyard. Uh, it has, in the wintertime, it keeps down the snow and the wind. And even Robert Frost has that famous quote, good fences make good neighbors. A fence marks your boundaries. It keeps animals in. And because we have a privacy fence in the summer, it's kind of nice to have a little bit of privacy. So a fence around Torah is actually the similar concept. Torah is the first five books of the Bible. <clears throat> and within Judaism, the Torah is the authority. It is what Jews turn to to figure out what is the word of God. And so that is what the concept of the fence around Torah means. And it is a concept that has been around for centuries. Just listen to how one, uh, one uh, rabbi describes it. We do not want to violate the Torah. If we create extra laws to protect the Torah, and we obey these extra laws, then we will not come close to disobeying the Torah. Newer, numerous rabbinical requirements can be understood as attempts to protect the Torah in this way. The most common example of protecting the Torah is the laws of kashrut, or Jewish dietary laws, especially the laws concerning milk and meat. The Torah exhorts us to not boil a kid or a baby goat in its mother's, mother's milk. This command is in the context of pagan Canaanite practice, it is also an obvious humanitarian deference to animal life. To protect this law, and there's the key, to protect this law, rabbis decided that eating milk and meat together, even if not from the same animal, 
should be avoided. We see this example also when eating pork, kosher dietary laws. Uh, there's an example of Orthodox men. Orthodox Jewish men do not touch women unless they're married to them or related to them. Now, the Bible doesn't say anything about men that men can't touch women, but because Torah is, the Bible is so holy, the idea is if you don't violate the spirit of the law, you don't violate the letter of the law. So let's look at that passage again. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Building a fence around Torah. This scripture sets us right in line with our definition. If sloth and anger and greed and gluttony and lust do not move us any closer to God, do not make us a better person than it, it, it is a deadly sin. And lust can actually be quite deadly. There's a report that came out about the Illinois Department of Natural Resources that 17,000 deer are struck and killed by motorists every year. Paul Shelton, who was the director of the Natural Resources area in Illinois, says that the, the, the peak of this is in the late fall, usually around November, because the bucks are in a rut, as he said. He says they're, con they're concentrating almost exclusively on reproductive activities and are a lot less weary than they normally would be. Then he adds, deer aren't the only creatures destroyed by the preoccupation with sex. So when you hit a deer, usually in the late fall or winter, you know they're, being pre they're preoccupied with other things. That's what's the idea here. Now, there's something that I noticed as I was working on this sermon series. Is the sins that we have here of, of, uh, of sloth and greed and gluttony, and then next week as we're going to talk about of pride and envy, um, can be matched with any castaway. In fact, I have seen theories that, that match all of those sins with each one of the castaways, except for anger, universally with the skipper, and lust, universally with the movie star. And I think I know why. Because those other five sins that we, we just talked about, uh, they're, they're, they're destructive, but they're more subtle. Think of the workplace. I mean, it takes time to realize which of your co-workers are not pulling their weight, which are stealing from the company, which are spending too much time on their break. But anger and lust, what we call heavy flirtation, I mean, we see that right away. That is easily recognizable. And that becomes very obvious in the characters from Gilligan's Island. The skipper, I mean, he's just always a bowl full of anger. And, and Ginger, you just expect her to be seductive. Um, I want to do an experiment here. Um, I want everyone, we've already done this already, but I want everyone to sing Happy Birthday. So go ahead right now and sing Happy Birthday. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. All right, so, and then I'm going to, I'm going to play something for you here. Um, so I'll, I'll need to make sure that this mic is on, and uh, so just kind of, there we go, so.
first, when that song came out, it was seen as kind of innocent. It was just a movie star singing to a very popular president. What we know now, <laughs> lust got the best of both of them. Now, if you think of Ginger Grant, the woman who was the movie star on Gilligan's Island, whenever she did her hair, whenever she dressed, whenever she sang, she was embodying Marilyn Monroe. And this we see on the TV all the time when we're watching Gilligan's Island. And for the most part, her flirtation is a bit innocent. But the sin of lust was most dramatic with the actress who we know is, her real name is Tina Marie. Now, I was telling you about that Bible study that I got uh, that was the reunion show. And as I was watching it, I noticed that the character that was playing uh, Ginger, the movie star, uh, she sounded different, she, she looked different, and sure enough, she was different. She was actually played by a character by the name of Judith Baldwin, and she was hired because she actually she looked like the younger version of Tina Louise. Everyone returned on the show except for Tina Louise. Well, I found some reports. Around the time that the reunion show came out, she said that Gilligan, Gilligan's Island ruined her career. In fact, she says she was forever typecast as Ginger Grant and that she couldn't get any other real TV or movie roles as she, quote, quote, because the world will always know me as the dim-witted, red-headed B-movie actress. She told the creators of the show that she would have no part in any reunion movies or anything to do with the Gilligan's Island franchise. TV Land actually gave this description. A true diva of classical television, Tina Louise wishes she never set foot on the uncharted desert island. Entering show business in the mid-50s, Louise worked as a nightclub singer and in Broadway productions such as Little Abner, while simultaneously making numerous TV appearances. She guest starred on shows of a variety of genres, including dramas Studio One, Westerns, of Tales of, of Wells Fargo, and comedy, Search of Vilco, and variety shows, The Dean Martin Show. After landing the part of Ginger Grant in Gilligan's Island, Louise found the role to be as difficult to escape as the fabled Isle. On bond discovering that she was not, as she had reportedly been told the star of the show, Louise never imagined Gilligan's Island would have such lasting appeal. Despite the millions of adoring fans who admire her captivating and sensual portrayal of movie star Ginger Grant, Louise became so uncomfortably associated with the role that she has spent a lifetime trying to leave it behind. And now I would say that the connection of the deadly sin of lust and the movie star reached its zenith with this guy, Howard Stern. In an interview with Tina Louise, he openly talks about his lust for Ginger. If you know Howard Stern, that doesn't surprise you. But I have to say this about Tina Louise. She doesn't bite. She tells Howard that she enjoyed the show, she had a good time working on it, but she has moved on. And later on in the interview, there actually is a caller that phones in. And again, he talks about this lust that he has for Ginger on the show. And Tina just reiterates, it was a show. She has moved on. And she implies others should do the same. Remember that definition. The sin of lust does not move us any closer to God. It is destructive. It is damaging to relationships and to careers and does not make one a better person. I think Jesus was on to something with this scripture passage. Good fences not only make good neighbors, but good fences do put something around the word of God. There's a story about two Buddhist monks who were talking just after, who were walking just after a thunderstorm. They came to a swollen creek. A beautiful young Japanese woman in a kimono stood there wanting to cross to the other side. But she was afraid of the currents. One of the monks said, can I help you? I need to cross this stream, she replied the woman. The monk picked her up, put her on his shoulder, carried her through the swirling waters and put her down on the other side. He and then his companion then went on to the monastery. That night, his companion said to him, 
I, I have a bone to pick with you. As Buddhist monks, we have taken vows not to look on a woman, much less touch her body, but back there by the river, you did both. My brother, answered the other monk, I put that woman down on the other side of the river, and yet you're still carrying her in your mind. As we've learned, the deadly sins do not move us closer to God. On the show, it kept the castaways stuck on the island. It's time to move on so we can build relationships with God and with our fellow human beings by leaving the sins of sloth, anger, and wrath, gluttony and greed, and now lust back on that island. At this point, we're going to ask our ushers to wait upon us as we get back to God.